Well, I will kick off just so that uh, we, we get going and I can give Emma as much time as possible. So my name is Hazel Robinson, um, along with working at the University of Manchester, managing their operations and reward functions. I'm also a member of the ECC board and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome today um, Emma Ogden to talk to us about, about doing well being well which is certainly an objective for all of us. Emma is a specialist in workforce development, talent management, change management, succession planning, organizational design and development. Having worked in senior HR positions at several UK universities, so truly, truly understands the challenges we have. Um, she's also delivered a very complex change project at the Red Cross, and she's currently specializing in HR management and target operating mo models design at SUMS. This session explores the ways in which universities can put the right support in place, build on effective processes and systems to meet the needs of um, HE employees and their managers. During the session, I would like you um, to use the Q&A function, as Danielle has already found, which is brilliant, and send through any questions and we'll try and cover as much as possible as, as we can at the end. And um, also, please use the chat um, if you have any comments at, at any points. That also helps if we don't get as many questions and it's more about statements and discussion points. So without any further ado, I'm going to jump off camera and I'm going to hand over to Emma. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hazel. What a lovely introduction um, and lovely to virtually meet you all as well. Um, my name, as, as Hazel's rightly said, is Emma Ogden, so I'm a consultant with Sums Consulting. Um, and thank you so much for joining the session this morning. Um, it's, it's lovely to have you all come along. Um, as, as Hazel's mentioned, so the session today is about how to um, do well-being well um, and specifically how to co-create staff and student approaches to a mentally healthy university community. Um, I think it's really important to say universities' greatest assets are their staff um, and I think as Danielle has quite rightly pointed the priorities and the drivers for how to support staff and students are very different. Um, it's without doubt that the pandemic has exacerbated mental health challenges and student mental health has been cast into the spotlight. And I think the, since the publication of the Step Change Framework, which I will talk through a little bit as part of the session today, they have rightly received some of that attention and investment. But supporting workforces should be a whole university approach. And I think that's really important to get across. And that's something that I'd really like to talk through um, today. As Hazel's mentioned, any questions, any comments, please feel free to put that in the chat box or the Q&A and I'll make sure I've got some time at the end to talk through some of those bits and pieces. Just as a bit of a very quick overview, so as I mentioned, I work as, um, as part of the SUMS group, so we're a membership-based higher educational consultancy. Um, we're also a registered charity and a not-for-profit organisation, so we provide consulting specifically to universities um, across all professional service and ac academic areas. Um, on the slide in front of you is some of the insights to some of the work that we've done over the past few years, and alongside our sister company, which is SUPC, which is our procurement function, and um, how we've supported some of our members. At the heart of this, um, we've done a lot of work around supporting mental health and well-being. And I will talk through some of the insights of, and some of the outcomes of those reviews as part of this session, because it really adds some detail in terms of the points that we're trying to make. So aims and outcomes, as always, we kind of start with those when we go through these sorts of sessions. So the session will explore ways in which institutions can put the right support in place. And that should be built on things such as effective processes, effective systems in order to meet the needs of higher education employees and their managers. We will think about talking about the complexities of difference as well. So things such as neurodiversity and provide some practical solutions from proven case studies, as I mentioned, through reviews that we've done with universities to help you think about how you might implement those sorts of changes at, at the university that you work. And hopefully that's in line with the aims and objectives that you've joined the session today. So just to start with just a bit of a spotlight, a bit of context in terms of where we are at this moment in time and thinking about well-being in 2022. So I'm sure we're all probably a bit fed up of talking about the pandemic. We're talk sick of talking about COVID-19, but we know how significant it's, it's been on culture, on engagement and on so many different driving factors at universities. 
it's been incredibly turbulent both inside and outside of the workplace and that has had a huge impact on employee well-being. At the start of the pandemic there was the highest rate of anxiety recorded since 2011 so as you can see that's a 12.5 percent increase and the key factors that were really contributing to that assessment of anxiety with, were elements such as financial hardship, reduced social engagement and, and heightened job uncertainty as well. And this, is, this has had a really um, strong impact on females in particular, uh, as well as people from deprived areas, BAME groups and those with learning difficulties. So talking through those um, examples of complexities of difference, I think is really important. You can see the quote on the right hand side um, from a CIPD report back in 2011 about saying it shouldn't have taken a global pandemic to push people's health and well-being to the top of corporate agendas. And it, it does continue to be at the top of agendas. Health and well-being has dipped a little bit in terms of leadership priorities in the last year, but certainly has been much higher than it's been for the kind of five, five or so years preceding that. I think this is unlikely to change. So if you think about it, students that have entered university this year are students who have never had exams and um, they have got reduced social skills. They need support around transition skills, living skills, academic skills. That we're seeing an increase of a requirement of specialist support from student services. But that also has an impact on staff as well, particularly those in working in academic areas, thinking about the role of, of things like the personal tutor and their duty to support students that are making that transition themselves. So we do need to have that requirement to think about proactive action to support staff. So elements have happened to take place to support that. So, for example, UCA has developed a new health, safe, health, safety and well-being framework, and that's got some really key areas of focus around well-being. And that includes elements such as supporting higher educational institutions to be supportive and have a supportive and open culture that normalises conversations about mental health and physical well-being, providing support to higher educational institutions to implement and sustain a whole university approach to well-being, which I'll talk about today. And that includes encompasses elements such as culture, communication, um, employee voice, supporting the role of line managers, thinking about effective workload management, as Danielle has talked about in the, in the chat, and raising awareness of appropriate support as well. Making sure that there's supportive development and sharing of good practice and innovation. So we often work in silos in universities. We don't do much in terms of looking at what the universities are doing, other approaches, learning from those approaches. It's a really good opportunity and I hope to share some of those insights with you today in terms of how we've supported a variety of different universities to think about innovation, to think about good practice approaches. Um, encouraging learning beyond the sector. Again, I think it's quite common within higher education that we, we're very quite insular. We look at just what um, higher education is doing, but thinking about what that learning might be outside of the sector and, and thinking about working with care organisations such as MIND or the NHS to support with some of these tools. And working with, as I've mentioned, other relevant sector organisations on wellbeing resources and guidance materials. So, as I mentioned, MIND have developed toolkits and they've got guidance to support identifying triggers and action plans. And one of the main elements that I want to talk through today is the UUK step change framework. And that's one that has been specifically developed for use in higher education. So I'll talk through that a little bit now in terms of the detail that sits within that. The final element just to mention is, and I think this is a real, I really like this graphic. It's from What Works Wellbeing, and it outlines the different types of fields of health and wellbeing. Um, and at the heart of this, I think it's the idea to consider wellbeing in the workplace against kind of three key principles. So one, um, the people work for people. So thinking about health and relationships. Secondly, the need to feel safe. So thinking about security and environment. And three, people needing to feel feel fulfilled and thinking about purpose. So when we think about well-being, often we just think about mental health, we think about physical health, but actually it encompasses a whole wide range of, of elements that sit within that. And I think it's really important to look at it from a more holistic um, place. So um, drawing upon all of those key influences, as I mentioned, the Universities UK Step Change Framework was devised to take on that whole university approach. So very much in, in line with the UCA guidance that was issued a couple of years ago, and that's really to tackle mental health and wellbeing at universities. So the framework calls on universities to see mental health as a foundation to all aspects of university life and for students and for staff. It also is aligned with the Student Minds University Mental Health Charter, if you're aware of that as well. 
UUK have outlined some principal aims of university settings when enabling positive mental health. So namely that uh, mental health and well-being should be a high strategic priority. It should be enabler for people to take responsibility for themselves and others through early intervention. It should um, promote positive, good mental health, but in the lines of key fields of mental health and well-being. And the framework is formed on four domains and five key enablers. And I'll talk through those a little bit in a second. But they essentially reinforce this idea of this whole university approach. So things such as leadership, information, co-creation between staff and students, having inclusivity, making use of research and innovation. Also, it really stresses the importance of that transition into university. So the context that I gave before in terms of students entering university this year and the challenges that they might be facing, but also elements such as partnership working, such as healthcare settings and the NHS. There is also an associated self-assessment tool. So something that's really good about this framework is that there's a number of resources that help universities to engage with it really positively. So the self-assessment tool is a really pragmatic way of assessing the current state that you're dealing with at the university. And it's one of the elements that we draw upon ourselves at SUMS when we do our independent review work. And we will align all of our assessments against this self-assessment in order to kind of give universities a real state of play about how things are working at this moment in time. So I mentioned the four domains and I keep mentioning um, the phrase a whole university approach. So what does that actually mean? So the achievement of that should enable um, learning, work, community and, and life as well. So against those four domains that you can see on the on the slide in front of you. Very much like the key drivers to well-being, a whole university approach looks at all aspects of work and life in order to promote and support student and staff mental health. So the, fr the, the framework, it's got those four domains that you can see in front of you and you can see the kind of examples of elements that might sit within that. So within the learn, it's things like the curriculum and how mental health and well-being is really embedded in terms of teaching and learning. Um, within the work, it's about having strategic approaches. It's about having trained staff. It's about having early effective interventions. Support is making sure that approaches are worked in partnership and co-created between staff and students. And then living is in thinking about those intangible elements such as culture, about promotion, about effective engagement, effective leadership, effective communication. So what do all of those things need to look like in order to promote and um, ensure positive mental health and well-being? So it's really important to recognise that mental health and well-being doesn't have that one size fits all. So the What Works Wellbeing um, framework is a really good example of that in terms of all the different domains that sit within mental health and well-being. But it's also really important to think about complexities of difference. So poor mental health and, and well-being um, can can in fact affect a number of people. And, and an example in front of you is, is neurodiversity. I'm not going to read through all of those elements that sit within the slide, but I think it's really useful context to understand all the different types of examples of, of conditions that people with neurodiversity might be um, might be going through. And that's real useful context for understanding how it impacts mental health and well-being. So to talk through that in a little bit more detail. Poor mental health and well-being is, is more common for people with neurodiversity and with neurodivergent conditions. It can also lead, as an example, to secondary mental health. So as an example of that, so someone that um, might have a neurodivergent condition may have struggled to meet academic and or societal expectations as they were growing up. That can culminate in, in further issues and further stress and anxiety when they reach adulthood, but they weren't necessarily aware of it when they were younger. Um, there can also be impacts for people with neurodiversity on elements such as their memory, their resilience, their ability to concentrate, um, and as I mentioned, stress as well. And it's really important that all initiatives and approaches cater for those. As I mentioned, it's not a one size fits all. So we talk about co-creation, but co-creation has to consider all varieties of individuals, all personalities, all different types of complexities and all different types of difference. Things such as strategies, interventions, training, all of those elements need to be really easily accessible for staff and students in order to make sure that they understand, recognise and also feel that it's appropriately tailored to support them. Approaching an off the shelf approach to mental health and well-being will never cater to every single need and every single complexity. So it's really important that time, energy and, and investment is made to make sure that that works really effectively. 
So as I mentioned, um, SUMS have supported a number of several reviews at UK institutions around mental health and wellbeing, and we've provided recommendations and guidance on how to, how to develop some of that co-created approach. Some of those examples are shown in, in the, on the slide in front of you, and I think it'd be really interesting to think about how many of these findings apply to you and yourself within your university. One element in particular I really want to pull out is um, we have, I think, in pretty much every single um, piece of work that we've supported universities in, we have recommended mandatory training for staff in mental health and wellbeing, suicide awareness and prevention. I think it's really important to, to really stress here that that is not training for academic staff to become therapists. And there's a real key distinction to make there in terms of the role and the duty of um, staff when supporting students and as well as the duty of um, members of staff and being able to support themselves and each other. So talking through some of the elements on the slide in front of you, uh, mental health and wellbeing is not, not often held at an executive level. In particular, you can find that um, staff mental health and wellbeing will quite commonly sit within HR. Student mental health and wellbeing will sit within a function such as registry. So immediately you've got two different functions having two different types of focus on mental health and wellbeing when actually holistically they should all be coming under one umbrella in terms of thinking about common themes such as in enhanced communication, enhanced support, co-creation, all the, all the bits that I've talked about already. Um, staff um, and student mental health um, are not generally built into the curriculum. Um, the role of support from personal tutors can often be really inconsistent from an academic side, so not understanding a kind of expectation management, what the role is of a personal tutor, what they're there to do, what they're there not to do. Um, and making sure that managers have specific training on how to ask about and how to support staff wellbeing. So something that I find um, from a HR perspective that I see quite a lot um, is the use of one-to-ones. So a lot of managers don't necessarily see the value and purpose of one-to-ones. Um, what they don't necessarily see is that could be a really good indicator to have a member of staff feel like they're able to just openly and transparently talk about some struggles that they're having. If those, if those facilitated conversations aren't in place, then all of a sudden a, a member of staff has to actively come forward and say that they're having a concern. So having those kind of regular communication points, I'm advocating, hopefully preaching to the converted here, but that's an example in terms of how we should be supporting managers to think about kind of absolute foundation baselines that we're expecting people to engage with. So I'm just going to pause really quickly because I've got a very quick poll, which hopefully Hazel will be able to support me with. And what I just want to get your thoughts around um, is whether you believe that the duty of care for staff and students is the same at universities. So I'll just pause quick, quickly just to give you a second to have a think about that. So I'll give you a couple more seconds and then we'll, we'll close. Okay, if we just, if we are okay to close that Hazel and we'll just see what sort of engagement we've had. Right, let me see if I can see the results. So yes, so more people have said that the duty of care is the same. So 10 versus um, six who've said no, which is actually really interesting. I kind of expected it to be the other way around. And um, so again, all, whilst universities do talk about duty of care, and we do talk about it a lot, no university I, I feel that we've worked with have actually been really able to define what they feel their responsibility and the parameters and the limits of that responsibility are. And I think at the heart of that is recognising that duty of care for staff and students do have some similarities but there might also be some very some varying degrees of difference and the reason I'd say that is maybe around expectation management so students that are first entering university might need more kind of directive support around mental health and well-being in terms of their role the pastoral support whereas I think reviews that we've done with universities more commonly mental health well-being support is kind of as far as here's a, an employee assistance program here's the support you can have and, and and we expect you to do a lot more to to support yourself and to manage yourself whereas students i think have a higher expectation of other people doing things for them so whilst the duty of care is probably very very similar as as the poll suggests i think that the mechanisms to support students and staff might differ slightly and um, it does mean that the support the strategies and pro and approaches should again cater for those different 
differences for the different expectations and for any variances that might be in place in terms of duty of duty of care. Okay, so drawing on that a little bit more. So I just wanted to um, touch on a couple of principles or some examples of really effective initiatives to think about how to effectively embed um, a co-created mental health approach within your own institution. So starting with just some really key principles. So firstly, I'd say absolutely ensure the fundamentals. So that might be documents such as policies, um, strategy. Have you got an employee assistance program service? Are you making use of that service? Do you get data? Do you get insights? What support is that service providing? What sort of engagement are your staff having with that service? Is there more that could be done to promote it? Um, what advice and guidance are you getting from them? So they should be third, third, third provider um, specialists. They should be giving you some data and insight. They should be giving you um, metrics that suggest actually at this time of year we might need to integrate a little bit more support about financial well-being so why don't we do kind of a promotion around this so thinking about how you can engage those people you're paying for that service you're paying for that membership so making best use of that as well executive ownership and leadership is really important as well so where is this sitting in terms of the leadership top table whose agenda is this on how are they supporting this have you got things such as governance frameworks? Have you got the right accountability in place? Have you got the right ownership? Is there an assumption that different people are owning this? Is there an assumption that actually the registry don't really deal with staff, so they're not as then they're, they're not as keen to support anything around staff well-being? HR are less involved in student activities, so they'll be less keen to support student well-being. Can you shift some of that thinking and some of that culture to say mental health and well-being is a factor that's impacting our entire university community and we need to be supporting everyone within that and, and having co-created approaches and having those functions working in, in greater alignment. So you really do need to start with that absolute baseline. As I mentioned, a co-created strategy document is really important because it helps you enable to set it enables you to set out what it is that you want to achieve, but it also provides a bit of a touch point to consider peripheral elements. So thinking about post pandemic landscape, um, we're, we're still talking about new ways of working. I don't think we can say they're new ways of working anymore. They're just ways of working. But again, they can have an impact on mental health and well-being. Some people prefer working in the office. Some people work, prefer working at home. It seems quite a binary opinion still. It still seems to be one that really divides people. So again, are there people that will function a lot better working from home and actually really struggle with being asked to come on site? Are there people that really struggle working from home and actually home circumstances might mean that they feel a bit more lonely and they need a bit more of that connection? So that needs to be encompassed within this sort of work in terms of the strategy development. Also, the EDI agenda. So I think we talked, I, one of the first things I said in terms of the context was how mental health and well-being had impacted different divergent groups. So we talked about neurodiversity, we've talked about gender, we've talked about ethnicity. People will be impacted by different ways and in different ways as a result of this. So again, thinking about how this supports a number of different groups. If you've got specific subgroups, different universities might have um, a gender group, they might have an equality group, they might have a race group. Talk to those individuals, talk to people about what's important to them, what do they need, how do we support different, different groups, different people. Have you got people that are representing neurodiversity? Have you engaged with those people? Do you are you aware of who those people are? And again, thinking about how these strategic approaches need to be supporting them as well. People matter. We've talked about this at the beginning. So thinking about different identities, thinking about different roles and thinking about those connectors and, and understanding the intersectionality. We, we're not very good at often thinking about intersectionality. We think about people as two dimensional beings with with not much kind of around that they're, they're one thing or another. But we need to think about that in terms of the multifaceted approaches that people are and, and that they have a number of different triggers and they have a number of different influences that mean who they are and we need to think about all of those different elements. I think there's got to be significant development in skills um, for leaders and managers um, to ensure inclusive and supportive conversations occur on a day to day basis. We talk about mandatory training. There's a lot of initiatives. I know people get quite um, training fatigued, particularly when they start at university. There's a lot of things that we have to ask them to engage with. So making sure mental health and well-being is really top 
of that priority list and making sure that managers feel equipped in order to have some of these conversations. It's really difficult to approach conversations about mental health and well-being. Um, some people really struggle to understand it, particularly if they, it's not something that they've suffered themselves. So making sure that both staff need to feel safe and heard, but managers also need to feel safe in order to have those conversations and not fearful for saying the wrong thing or not fearful of not being able to tackle it in the right way. Um, again, thinking about duty of care within all of that as well. So um, people need to not be afraid to speak out and you need to kind of start with that training and support in order to change the culture, to have a much more open, transparent, pragmatic approach to being able to allow people to have these conversations more openly. And I think it's really key to ensure that mental health is addressed directly, consistently and persistently. And, and that's that cultural piece. And that's really that's the really challenging thing to, to feel and hear. Um, but I think starting with the, some of those initiatives, starting with the baseline, starting with the foundation, just having it as part of an agenda, as part of a conversation, getting people to really start advocating what that looks and feels like at that institution is really important. As I talked about at the beginning, in terms of the different drivers for mental health and well-being, it's not always emotional. So I think it's really important to think about all the key pillars of well-being. So that could be anything from physical, social, emotional, financial and digital. Again, post-pandemic landscape, there's been a huge drive to adopting digital technologies a lot more. That can be really stressful for some people. Um, so again, is that something that you're thinking about in terms of supporting? Is that underpinning all of these activities that are happening at the moment? So hopefully I'm talking to a number of um, key HR practitioners who really understand um, hopefully a lot of the things that I'm saying today, but I'm also some other considerations I think wanted to give as talking about the role of HR within this, because again, it, it often feels like it's, it's something that sits at HR's door. If we think about kind of traditional HR personnel, the support, the well-being, the pastoral support and, and there is still a bit of that in place at universities. There's still an expectation that HR is there to kind of manage all of these problems on behalf of people. And we need to start shifting some of that thinking to, again, the role of the line manager, the role of, of other supportive services to make sure that this is supporting everyone and is being dealt with from all avenues. So HR does have a role to ensure mental health and well-being is embedded. So they might be thinking about things such as promotion, prevention, intervention, um, thinking about those all those four pillars of the step change framework. That might include um, elements such as training, development, resourcing. Um, EDI often sits within HR, so inclusivity. Leadership is often a function that HR advocate and support and, and get huge involvement with. So again, that's something that maybe HR can get involved in. As I said before, thinking about your EAP supplier, often that relationship sits within HR as well. Um, but then having opportunities for everyone to engage, so through mechanisms such as action learning sets, agreeing priorities, having learning and training needs analysis, understanding capabilities of staff and capacity as well. Um, we, we ask a lot of people and, and that's only getting worse over the over since pandemic, particularly since we've moved to a more hybrid working space. So making sure people have the time and energy to invest in this as well. And I think much of this requires obviously sustained funding in order to start to get those outcomes and that's often a challenge as well making sure that you need to you've got financial investment to making sure that this is going to be adopted and worked to effectively so start with the measures and start with what it is that you want to achieve and how it is that you're going to achieve that and what mechanisms do you need in order to make sure that is that additional funding is that additional resource embedding it into the curriculum so things like academic workload modeling and um, most universities do have some form of an academic workload model and academic workload plan is that embedded within this is that are people getting that time and space to work through those sorts of approaches and the UK step change framework provides a roadmap for improvement. So rather than ticking boxes, um, it needs to be embedded and it needs to be an ambition of an initiative to ensure that it's future focused and it's and it's not it's not a rhetoric. It needs a rhetoric isn't it doesn't achieve cultural change. A rhetoric is a one on one off initiative It's a tick box exercise to say, well, we'll deal with this now and then we'll move on from it. So having that baseline, having that foundation, starting with those things to really then think about what other elements do we need to start thinking about to make sure that this is a step change. And that's why the UK framework is called the step change framework. It talks about the journey that you need to go on to get there. 
and work that we've done with universities have supported that step change approach. So we started by saying, OK, these are these are what you've got in place at the moment. This is your baseline. This is how you need to build on that a little bit further. And we will set out a roadmap. We'll support universities to say phase one, phase two, phase three, whatever that time scale might be. This is how you might want to think about getting to that future state. We recognize you're not going to get there immediately. That isn't going to be the final point that you need to get to. But there's a number of steps that you need to make to get there. Um, considering networks and services, so using MIND, using integrated care services such as the NHS, as I mentioned, your EAP provider and inter-university connectivity will enable that shared best practice and networking both internally and externally. Make use of the tools that you've got within, within your own institution, make use of the professionals that you've got and, and think about how some of that sharing of, of load and sharing of initiatives can be done most effectively. I think risk needs to be managed really effectively. So staff student expectations, as I mentioned before, so we talked about duty of care, but also student expectations and staff expectations. Are there any red lines? Are there any points where you'd say, actually, that isn't something that we should be supporting with? So as I mentioned before, suicide prevention, um, that isn't a role for an academic to take on that role. It's, it's to make sure that they know how to signpost effectively. So being really clear what those red lines look like. And making sure that you've got everyone engaged as well. Um, finally, I'm always going to talk about data because I think data and analytics are really important. But use use some of the data that you've got access to at the moment. So thinking about your turnover, thinking about your absence, thinking about those who have reported disabilities. And I have seen something pop up in the Q&A about neurodiversity and actually why are they not considered. I think often it's that people aren't reporting it. I think people aren't self-disclosing that they have a neurodivergent condition. And I think there's a nervousness about it. I think there's a fear about raising it. So look at your data. Do you have a, a smaller than baseline um, reported number of disabilities? Do you have a high rate of absence? What What is being done about those things? Are they in critical areas? Doing a real deep dive into some of those things and understanding it can be a really good baseline to say, where do we need to really focus some of our energy and attention? And again, some work that we've done within SUMS has helped with benchmarking around that. So we can give you some insight in terms of other universities and what their reporting figures look like. So all of those things, I think, are really important to think about how we get to that final place in terms of that co-created approach for mental health and well-being. I'm conscious I've, I've, I've waffled on for quite a long time. We've got about seven minutes left. Um, I just wanted before we, we go on to the q and I just want to really thank you for your time um, this afternoon. And I, if at any point anyone wants a further discussion or an op opportunity to explore any of these elements, please don't hesitate to reach out. My contact details are on the slide. Um, but I'd love to get some thoughts or comments from any of you or, or any questions that you might have. Emma, thank you so much. I think that was a, a very fast journey but incredibly detailed and, and a lot of takeaways that I'm sure, well, I've certainly noted a whole yeah. bunch of them. And I think one of the most, um, you know, sort of the biggest priorities is about being collaborative in this space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I made a few notes about not just working within and across our sector, but going outside of that. Mm -hmm. But the, the start of a 10 is just working across our departments. <laughs> Yeah, we don't we just don't think about it. And, and I understand why I understand the way that our we often align to our university structures. So HR is HR, finance is finance, estates is estates. And, and just because we're all so busy and we're doing so much every day in our everyday lives, we don't think about actually the other side of that. But when you ultimately come back to what a university is there to serve, we are a community and we should be thinking about mental health for staff and students as one approach. It, it saves reinventing the wheel because I'm sure many universities are separately looking at initiatives and um, spending time and money in doing that when actually some of the outcomes are probably very similar. Yeah, yeah. And that lends to Daniela's point about the priority of staff is that is, yeah. is their work being done because we yes. are all very busy and that does add to the equation and then you're asking someone they almost see doing well-being as being something extra that i yeah. have to do yeah as opposed to it should be something that takes away some of that um, yeah enables the the conversations and enables those safe spaces to be created where yeah. an employee can chat to their manager and say i need help and the manager can say i don't have all the answers yeah and that needs to be safe from both and i think i, I think that's a really important point hazel and i think actually in take the courage from a manager to say i'm not the expert here i'm not the yeah. right person to help you but actually i know the answers where you can go i know who you need to speak to and i think managers get really fearful of having that conversation and so often it just doesn't get raised. I remember a couple of years back there, there was a whole 
onslaught of encouraging hairdressers um, to not be therapists, but just mm. to listen. And sometimes that that really does come close to home that actually as a manager, just listening is sometimes really, really helpful. Yeah, yeah. Claire has asked that, um, can we please pop up the slide before the UK step change slide again? So I don't know if you can scroll can. back. Is it this one? You can also download the slides, Claire, I believe. So in the, yes. um, there's like a little download button at the top right hand side and this session has been recorded. So um, yeah, hopefully that's the slide you can see in front of you. But if not, um, do reach out to me and I'm more than happy to share anything with you directly if you want that. Fantastic. Um, Vanessa's raised a, a really valuable point, and that is around neurodiversity and, and how little it's spoken yeah. about. And I think it's it's really interesting. The point Vanessa makes is, is also that we are likely to have a higher ratio of ne neurodivergent staff. Yeah. Um, and it is that balance between providing the support, but also providing the tools to be able to recognize that support's needed. Yeah. Yeah, I I think it's I think it's fascinating about um, complexities of difference and neurodiversity. I think one, it's not understood. I think that's a huge factor. I think people don't quite understand what neurodiversity looks like and feels like. And, and that slide in front of you, you can see how many different conditions might sit within that kind of overall term. I also wonder whether there's something a little bit cultural that sits within this. So speaking from experience, my brother has autism and he's in his late 30s now but i remember him at school and the challenge to get diagnosed um as a child was nigh on impossible um yeah. it almost didn't happen so i wonder whether there's a lot of people that suffer and aren't aware that that, that might be under a condition of neurodiversity some people don't like to be labeled some people don't like the diagnosis but it is how aware people might be in terms of understanding what some of these elements are and actually saying actually that could mean this 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 is normal it is okay that i struggle with concentration it's okay that i struggle with my memory because actually there might be an explanation behind it so again i think it's not just about once that label's been given, once that diagnosis has been given, but understanding kind of the symptoms and the causes that sit within that and how we support different people. So I think as Vanessa said, there's there's very likely to be a very high ratio of neurodivergent staff. And I think the real takeaway for me is to think about that everyone is different, everyone has complex needs um, and not applying a one size fits all approach to say, actually, we've put in this intervention and that's gonna support everyone with mental health and wellbeing yeah. because they're all the same. Absolutely. And I think this is one of the areas where there is that differential between our, our students and, and staff because yeah. Typically, our students have grown up in an environment where we're far more likely to talk yeah. about neurodiversity yeah. than than our, our our staff have, and and as you say, that limit that self limit that we impose in terms of not wanting to be labelled or mm -hmm. not wanting to be seen to be awkward or need help or need, yeah. you know, it, it's, yeah. there's a stubbornness that comes in and that's generational as well, I think. Yeah. And it, I think, again, thinking about some of the signs of neurodiversity can be seen as, as a performance issue. So again, someone might take longer to process something. They might have heightened levels of stress. They might struggle with change. They might struggle coming out of the pandemic. All of those things, the initial response is, well, they just need to get on with it. This is what we're dealing with now and not and suggesting that's the problem of the individual and actually not something that is outside of their control. Absolutely. And I think that conversation then lends exactly into Daniela's point around EDI and wellbeing need to work better yes, together. They do. In order to be effective, they need yeah. to recognise that collaboration is so paramount it really um, is they are two separate at the moment and, and i agree there daniel yeah and then a, a final point or a final question and i'll pop over to chat um are well-being platforms an effective well-being solution to doing well-being well i think they are they are a solution i think um it's really important that they're integrated effectively as a as a supportive mechanism that sits within the culture of the university. So here is an external platform. Here is some ex external resources that you can access because we recognize that you might want some confidential support or guidance or not always want to go to your line manager. I think if it is the standalone yeah. point of support, then it is less effective. And that's what my point about kind of EAP services, which is kind of if you just signpost that way, you're kind of absolving responsibility. It's a starter for 10, which is yeah. great. 
Okay. Yeah. We've got a few seconds left um, mm -hmm. if we're still online. Um, the next item on the program is the lunch and networking carousel. I'd invite you to take time to, to go through the personal development area, um, have a look at the networking carousel, book appointments with peers, etc. Following lunch, the AGM will commence at 13.20. Try and attend that. This is your AGM, so hope to see you there. And that leaves me with nothing else to say, but other than a huge, huge thank you to Emma. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you so much. Take good care, everyone. Look after yourselves and each other. Thank you.